Lord, Father, now we bow before you. There are so many gods in our world that clamor for our attention, our devotion, our worship. But Father, we proclaim that there is but one God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God, the Lord is one. There is none like you. Now we come to worship. Father, thank you for revealing yourself to us in the living word, Jesus. And sharing with us your heart for us in the written word, the scripture. And as we open it up this afternoon or this morning, Father, guide us, give us understanding Help us, Father, not just to know with our minds, but, Father, may your word guide our steps through the day. In Jesus we pray. Amen. O oh God, you are my God. I shall seek you earnestly. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh yearns for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. That's the first verse of Psalm 63. My soul longs for God. It yearns for God. It thirsts for God in a dry and weary land where there is no water. A desert land. A wilderness land. You ever feel like that? Has Psalm 63 1 ever expressed your thought, your sentiment? God, I long for you, but, but my, my soul is parched. And all around me is dry and empty and barren. I've been there. I've been there a multitude of times. And I assume I will someday be there again. Moses lived in the desert. And then led the people of Israel as they wandered in the desert. Elijah spent time in the desert. Paul spent time in the wilderness. Jesus goes out into the wilderness. And it becomes a part of our experience as well. Not just a physical wilderness like maybe going to the southwestern part of the United States or to the Saharan part of the African continent but of the soul. Today, I want to launch a four-week study from Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. It's 40 days of Jesus being in the wilderness. And today really serves kind of as a foundation to what's to come. So I'll warn you, not just with my suspenders, but with the sermon as well. If you go home today seeing that seem somewhat incomplete, uh, yeah, it is. Because there's three more parts to come. I want us to be a people who are willing to follow Jesus' example. And to go where God will take us, wherever it might be. And that we might walk with him even into the wilderness. Even to a dry and weary land where there is no water. But if we're going to follow Jesus there, we need to be aware that there are certain dangers. For Jesus, it was a time of isolation. Jesus knew, and we need to know, that we never are truly all alone. For God is with us. His Spirit dwells within. Jesus, we're going to read in just a minute, was led by the Holy Spirit. But sometimes you really long for a friendly face, a listening ear, a kind smile, human interaction. And sometimes when we wander in the wilderness, we'll find that maybe we're surrounded with people, but we feel all alone. There's a sense of isolation and there's danger in isolation. There are moments when we need silence and solitude, where we need to retreat to where it is only you and God. But if that's where we live, if we never move out and engage with others, there's danger there. If you go out into the wilderness, you might find that there's a lack of food and water. 
When I was little, I'd watch a lot of, of movies, and there were those classics where someone would be crawling through the desert sand, dehydrated, longing simply for something to drink. And what would they see? They would see a mirage, a, a, a fantasy of their own mind. So deeply did they need water that they saw water. And they would pick up handfuls of sand and shove it into their face. <laughs> totally unsatisfying. There are times in the spiritual wilderness where we longer so much for God that we might settle for something that is merely a fantasy. There's danger there. And there are snakes there. Some people like snakes. You might remember Nate and Brianna Mulholland, they got married, moved to Oklahoma. If you follow them on Facebook, they have a huge snake as a pet. A huge snake as a pet. And, you know, it just kind of slithers around the house. At least put the thing in a terrarium. Now, you know, it wanders around the house. Not me. I will take a club to it, Okay. But when you go out into the desert, there are dangers. And sometimes the serpent is not just a big snake that you keep for a pet, but it is the ancient serpent, the devil, who comes seeking to destroy. He's a liar and the father of lies. We meet him here in this text as he encounters Jesus. So I want to read for you Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. I'll be reading from the New American Standard. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and he said, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Then the devil took him into the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus said to him, On the other hand, it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things I will give to you if you fall down and worship me. And then Jesus said to him, Go, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And then the devil left him. And behold, angels came and began to minister to him. Chapter 4, verse 1 is intriguing, is it not? And then, on the heels, if you go back to chapter 3 of Jesus' baptism, Jesus has come to John the Baptist at the Jordan River. He has been baptized by John there to fulfill all righteousness. This is the thing, Jesus says, that he was to do, and subsequently that we are to do. But on the heels of that baptism, a very wonderful moment. We're told that the Spirit descends upon him as a dove. We're told that a voice from heaven, the voice of the Father said, this is my beloved Son. In him I am well pleased. This is one of those moments that is like a, a spiritual mountaintop. It can't get any better. And then immediately, right on the heels of that experience, the Spirit leads Jesus into the wilderness. And we're told that he was led there for a purpose. That he might be tempted of the devil. 
And you might kind of recoil at that. You might say, well, why would God allow such a thing? Doesn't God seek to keep me safe from the devil? Don't we pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil? Yes. And there's a couple things I want to just remind you of. I think it's important, first of all, to realize who the tempter is. We're even told, and after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he became hungry, and the tempter came and said to him. The tempter is Satan. The tempter is the devil. The Satan is this enemy of God and the enemy of man. The tempter is this fallen angel who thought he could be God and foolishly rebelled and well, hell is prepared for Satan and for his angels. Satan is not an equal with God. You do know that, right? Satan is a created being. He is a lesser being. It's not like in the force of Star Wars where there's good and evil. There's light and dark. I love what Martin Luther said. Luther said, no matter how bad the devil may be, he is still God's devil. And what he meant by that is, here is God, and the devil's not here, the devil's here. He is subject to God. But the temple was a rebel. And though his doom is sure, he fights against God and against God's people. So James tells us in James 1.13, do not be deceived. God, God does not tempt, nor is God tempted. So let's be careful that we do not cast aspersion upon God. But we do read in Matthew 4.1 that the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, leads Jesus out into the wilderness. And this wilderness wandering, 40 days of prayer and fasting and being tempted. The thing that comes up in my mind is the simple word, why? Why? Why couldn't Jesus live in some kind of, of spiritual bubble that kept him isolated from the evils of this world? Well, very simply, because he had to be like us in order to be our sacrifice. It's really a very simple idea. I want to walk through a few passages of Scripture. 1 John, 1 John chapter 2 Verses 1 and 2. The beloved apostle says, My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation, or your translation may say the atoning sacrifice, for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. Jesus is described in various ways in these two verses. First of all, I want to pick out that word righteous. Some translations add the word one. He is the righteous one. You remember what a sacrifice that was going to be offered to God has to be in order to be acceptable? It has to be pure, blameless, spotless. It has to be a perfect sacrifice. You could not take the, the crippled lamb from your flock or the diseased lamb from your flock and say, okay, God, you can have this one. No. A sacrifice to God, pure, blameless, spotless. And so Jesus, if he is going to be the Lamb of God who is offered up for the sins of the world, he has to be the righteous one. Pure, blameless, spotless. And John tells us in these two verses that indeed that is who he is. He is the righteous one. Because he is righteous, we're told that he's an advocate. He's an advocate. He gets to speak to the Father on our behalf. Elsewhere, the New Testament tells us that Jesus lives to make intercession for us, for the, for the believer, for the Christian, for the church. It boggles my mind that when I 
rebelliously disobey God. I sin against God in the weakness of my humanity. Jesus steps forward and speaks on my behalf. No, I'm sure it's far more reverent than this. But I can sometimes hear Jesus say, Father, I know Bill's a screw up. And I know this is the umpteenth time that he has screwed up. But Father, he's mine. I purchased him with my blood at the cross. And he surrendered himself to me in his faith. He's mine. Forgive him, Father. Forgive him. He's an advocate. He speaks on my behalf, even though I'm guilty. Isn't that interesting? And he can do that because the third way that John describes him is that he is a, in the New American Standard, a propitiation, or in the New International Version, he's the atoning sacrifice. We're back to the idea of sacrifice. He is the Lamb of God. I love the picture of Jesus actually coming onto the public scene during the time of John the Baptist's ministry. And John points to him and tells those gathered around him, look, behold, take notice, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Wow. Because he is the atoning sacrifice. He's the one who bears my sin, who bears your sin, who makes us new, who purchases us with his blood, because he, the righteous one, can do so. You see, Jesus is the righteous one by divine nature. He is God. And he is the righteous one through his human obedience. Perfect in every way. That takes me to the book of Hebrews. I want to look at Hebrews 1, Hebrews 2, and Hebrews 4. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, we're given a, an idea of just who Jesus is. It's a very simple statement. The writer says, and he, Jesus is the radiance of his, the Father's, glory, the exact representation of his nature. Maybe a clearer way to put it is to remember what the Apostle Paul wrote in the book of Philippians chapter 2, that he, Jesus, being in very nature God. Being in very nature God. So when you want to know what is God like, what does God look like, how does God deal with people, look to Jesus, because Jesus is God with us. We sang that this morning. Jesus is God with us. And if you flip over to chapter 2 of Hebrews, verses 14 and 15, you read, Therefore, since the children, and that's a reference not to little children, it's a reference to people. You and I are a part of this. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself, Jesus, Likewise, also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless he who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. So Jesus, who is divine, God, in order to redeem us, took on flesh and blood. He became just like us. He was carried in Mary's womb for nine months. He was born and probably cried a little bit, maybe cooed a little bit. But he had to be fed and he had to be bathed and he had to be changed and he had to be kept warm. He had to learn to walk. He had to learn to talk. 
And yet by the time he's 12, he's teaching the teachers in the temple in Jerusalem. And even at that early age, he says, did you not know that I must be about my father's business? Uh, not building tables in a carpentry shop. But bringing reconciliation between God and men. He took on flesh and blood. But it's not just about the living, it's about the dying. So that through death, he might defeat the one who holds the power of death. He might defeat who? The devil. The guy we have back in Matthew chapter 4, who's tempting him in the wilderness. Jesus came to defeat the devil, but he had to do it through death. And through that victory over the evil one, he sets us free. He frees those of us who all our lives have lived in fear. A fear of death. Because what's on the other side? What awaits me? Well, we know for the Christian, the righteous one awaits us who will say, welcome home, my good and faithful servant. Been waiting for you. Why don't you pull up a chair? Let's talk for a while. Maybe there's horses in heaven. And Jesus will say, hey, let's go for a ride. Wouldn't that be cool? I hope there's hockey in heaven. There's none in hell because it's too hot for the ice. <laughs> no one laughs. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. Do I need to read that again? We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. We're back to Matthew 4, aren't we? Why in the world would the Spirit of God lead Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted? Because the righteous one, by divine nature, had to be righteous by human character if he was to save you and me. For there to be any understanding whatsoever of our weakness... He, after fasting for 40 days, hungry and tired and isolated and facing the dangers of the wilderness, would be tempted in every way just as we are. You can never look at God and say, you don't understand what it's like to be me. He goes, oh, really? Have you forgotten that I came in the person of Jesus? Have you forgotten I was born as a baby, that I grew, that I taught and was rejected, that I was crucified? Have you forgotten that I was tempted in every way as you have been, and yet I was without sin? Don't tell me I don't know what it's like to be you. I do. For I was fully human. And because Jesus did that, verse 16 says, Therefore, because of that, we can draw near with confidence to the throne of grace. The throne of grace, that's, that's the Father's throne. We can come into the presence of the Father. And we can come there with confidence. Reverence, yes. But with confidence, not fearing, is he going to kick me out because I've gone too far? Is he going to say, no, I'm fed up to hear with you, Bill. I can approach the throne of grace with confidence so that I can find and so that you can find mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. When we're in the desert, when we find ourselves longing for God in a dry and weary land where there is no water, our spirits are parched, our hearts are breaking, our minds are troubled and confused and befuddled. Nothing seems right and God seems distant. 
with confidence we can come before His throne and find grace and mercy. And He will walk through us through the desert. He will help us in our time of need. And see, that takes me to these next three weeks. In the past, I've preached this text as one sermon. Hey, there's three temptations that Jesus faces. A perfect three-point sermon. Makes me happy. I'm not going to look so much at the temptations Jesus faces. I want us to look at how when we walk with Jesus in the wilderness, because of who He is, the righteous One who is the atoning sacrifice, who stands as our advocate, we have grace and help in our time of need. And when we look at these three temptations, I want us to talk next week about what do we do when the soul is hungry. And yet we seek to satisfy with a handful of mirage-induced water, which is nothing more than sand. And the week after, I want us to talk about what do we do when as Christians we still deal with doubts. When fears assail and our minds just cannot grasp the things of God's word and doubt may grip our heart. And faith seems frail. And the week after that, what do we do when the things of this world clamor for our devotion and would even seek to unthrone God? I think those are temptations we face. The soul's hunger, the mind's struggle. The heart's division. We'll find that in Jesus, there's some answers. Jesus stood on Scripture. Three times in Matthew chapter 4, he answers the temptations of the devil with these words it is written. It might do us well to spend some time in Scripture. It might do us well to find our answers in the Word of God rather than in the counsel of the world that doesn't know Him. We'll see in Jesus that He loved the Father, and because He loved the Father, He obeyed the Father, and He was able to stay focused, or He was able to deal with these temptations because He stayed focused on the Father. And I love the fact that as He deals with the third temptation, Satan says, look around you. Here's everything in the world. You want it? It's yours. All you have to do is bow down before me. Jesus says, go, Satan. Get out of here. Beat it. I'm sick and tired of you. I'm tired of listening to you. Go. James chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, James tells us to submit to God and to resist the devil. And he, the devil, will flee from you. I fear sometimes we just throw up our hands far too easily. No. Because the Holy Spirit dwells within you. The Holy Spirit who leads you. He who is greater than the one who is in the world. We can resist the devil. And he has no choice but to turn tail and run. Don't miss that. I began in... Psalm 63. I want to take you back there here for just a second. Just listen. Oh God, you are my God. None other. Oh God, you are my God. And I will seek you earnestly. With all my strength, with all my energy, with all my devotion, with all my focus, with everything is, I will seek you earnestly. For my soul thirsts for you. And my flesh yearns for you. I am crawling through the spiritual desert, hands and knees, parched. I am in a dry and weary land where there is no water. But King David does not stop there. He says, thus I have seen you in the sanctuary. To see your power and your glory. David could remember even in the most intense moments of struggle. The glory of God. The power of God. The worship of God. He could not forget. 
And so he says, because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live and I will lift up my hands in your name. Verse 5, my soul is satisfied. It doesn't say will be satisfied. He says, my soul is satisfied. Here I am, thirsty, longing, a dry and weary land. But wait a minute, God, when I stay focused on you, I find this to be the case. My soul is satisfied as with morrow and fatness, and my mouth offers praises with joyful lips. He said, I have a feast before you, O God. It's like Thanksgiving dinner with the family. I have just pushed myself back from the table after my 14th helping of turkey and dressing. I've got to loosen my pants. When I remember you on my bed, I meditate on you in the night watches. For you have been my help. And in the shadow of your wings, I sing for joy. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. I have been in just a little bit of a desert. I'm not deep in the desert. I'm not wandering around with mirages of oases popping up in front of my face. But I, I, I'm... I'm I've been in a bit of a, a dry land in my soul. A part of that is self-inflicted through the neglect of spiritual disciplines that I need to keep myself spiritually nourished. Good, solid times of prayer rather than just kind of fleeting. Hey, God, how you doing? Don't want to forget you, but I'm busy now. Okay, I'll get back to you. Being in the Word Deeply and intently for my own nourishment, not just so that I have something to share in a class or from the pulpit. Struggles with the effectiveness of what I do. You know, forgive me, I'm being, I'm being reflective of myself here, not of you, okay? In my mind, wondering if... Sunday morning sermons are having any value or if I'm just flapping my gums. Okay, self-doubt type of stuff. I've been in a spiritually dry place. And then I look beyond just the ministry and I look at our world. You know, another school shooting. You know, and everybody's mad and everyone's upset and everyone's casting aspersions and everyone's got an answer. Now there is one under whose wings I am sheltered. God's. And did I look out there and I think, man, our world's a mess, isn't it? Just mess out there. You know, we hear so much about uh, sexual harassment, the Me Too movement. I got five daughters. I don't know if they'd ever tell me if someone had abused them. I hope they would have told me. They might be afraid I'd take a baseball bat to them. But how do we protect people? It's an ugly world. It's an ugly world. It snows. That's like, nah, I won't go there. It snows and the roads get slick and we read about seven people died and there were 185 accidents just in Iowa alone. And my initial response is, people, you live in Iowa. It snows here, you know. You know? We live in a snow state. We do this every year. Wise up, folks. I got four-wheel drive. <laughs> Sorry. My sarcasm is coming out. All right. Do you ever just want to say, people, you're stupid? You ever, you ever want to just do that? You know, I do sometimes. Not to you guys. Not to you guys. I want to do that when I look at the news or I listen to what's going on in the world. 
And then I realized something. The world is a dry and weary land where there is no water. And whether we realize it or not, the vast majority of the people in the world do not know this God that we know. Oh, Lord, my God, you are my God, and I will seek you earnestly. But the vast majority of people have no clue. They don't know where to turn. They've heard a million different answers, none of which are sufficient, because none of them include God. And all of a sudden, my heart melts just a little bit. And I think, okay, Bill, you're not so bright yourself, so quit calling other people stupid. Bill, you've been forgiven, so why don't you be forgiving of other people? God, you've been a recipient of the grace and mercy of God, which you can receive from him with confidence. Why don't you be the conduit through which that grace and mercy is shared with other people? And all of a sudden, I find that even though I might feel like I'm kind of in a spiritual wasteland for a while, I'm not alone. And God will nourish my soul. And he will work through me to bring about his good purposes in the lives of others. I don't know where you're at, my friends. Right now, you may be in one of those holy moments like Matthew chapter 3, Jesus' baptism by John at the Jordan. The Spirit has descended in the form of a dove. You've heard the word of God. This is my beloved son or daughter. I'm well pleased with you. And you're just kind of, oh, this is nice. Or you may be. You may be deep in the desert. Say, so I know God loves me up here, but man, my life is such a struggle. Read Psalm 63. Read Psalm 63. Read Matthew 4. And come back next week. Because we've got some things to look at. Nick, if you and uh, our musicians would come forward, I'm going to ask you guys to lead us in a song. And for us to take a moment simply to hear Jesus' invitation, follow me. Follow me. I started by saying we might need to follow Jesus into the wilderness, even as Jesus followed the Spirit into the wilderness. If I go where he leads me, it need not be a fearful thing. Because he would not lead me there to destroy me.